Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Turning Tides Pod on Twitter. For more information, or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Warning this episode of Turning Tides contains graphic depictions of violence, torture, sexual assault, rape, and murder. Timor, scourge of God, Lord of the Fortunate Conjunction, Lord of the Seven Climes and conqueror of the world, rode into his capital, Samarkand, at the head of his victorious army. He was a nomad, but he loved this city, which had now been dubbed the Rome of the East. Samarkand was Timur's first conquest, and he did all he could to defend and enrich the city. The 150,000 inhabitants enjoyed Timur's protection and the never-ending supply of new treasures. Before the emperor's arrival, the people had been sick with despair. Rumor had it that Timur was ill and near death, and that his Tatars were met with defeat on the Terek River. It became clear these rumors were unfounded when camels, horses, and donkeys, overburdened with loot, paraded into the city. Timur declared a three-year tax amnesty for all of the people of Samarkand, the state could be funded solely by the Golden Horde's usurped resources. Timur would spend the next two years away from the seat of war, ruling a vast empire, commissioning massive building projects and parks, and doling out justice to those who were considered corrupt. Timur was now 61. Anyone else in his position would be content. Timur, however, was growing anxious about staying in his capital. He boasted a child could carry a pouch of gold from western Persia all the way to Samarkand without facing harassment from thieves. His empire was run by his children and grandchildren. While his emirs and Tovachi supplied his men in the field and were responsible for recruitment. The duties of these men were incredibly vague and required Timur's personal intervention to function. It was a government of one, by one, for one. Additionally, Timur relied on Persian and Mongolian legal traditions to form the basis of law for his empire, maintaining the law which had been set since Genghis Khan's time. In the center of Samarkand was the Gok Sarai, or Blue Palace. This structure projected Timur's strength. It housed many of the workers and architects who were forced to live under Timur's rule. Then there was the Bibi Kanum, or Cathedral Mosque. It was built in honor of one of Timur's many wives. Its pomegranate-shaped dome was a completely new design for the Tatars, who had previously used the block design for all their buildings. Timur may have quote-unquote borrowed his architecture style from the Middle East, and it will go on to influence countless buildings throughout Asia. Never resting, Timur then commissioned the Shah-e-Zinda, or the Mausoleum of the Living King. Thanks to Timur's vast expansion of the site, it became a Mecca of the East, bringing pilgrims and travelers throughout the Dar al-Islam, or the Muslim world. There was the Tumen Aga Mosque, named after the twelve-year-old whom Timur married in his forties. Additionally, there were countless other universities, wells, holy buildings, and parks built to entertain the nearly 200,000 residents of Samarkand. Today, statues and monuments to Timur litter modern-day Uzbekistan. His statues are frequented by newlywed couples seeking blessings from Timur beyond the grave. During these two years of economic prosperity and peace, Timur looked eagerly toward his new conquests. He had usually pushed west, 
and he had designs on Asia Minor and the Caliph in Egypt. His main interests, however, were in the east. Here the Ming Emperor had only recently begun ruling China, and to the south, the princes of Delhi fought an unending civil war. These both provided opportunistic possibilities for Timur. He believed the easier of the two would be the conquest of India. This would secure his southern flank from the anarchy taking place there. Additionally, this would be an incredible accomplishment for the Tartar ruler. Alexander the Great barely made it past the Indus River while Genghis Khan believed India's climate was too treacherous for battle. Timur's Tovachi and subordinate emirs were disconcerted by this plan. India was too hot, too forested, and too vast. The rivers alone would be a massive obstacle for the Tartar horsemen, who relied on swift and decisive movement. Timur refused to hear his men's concerns. When he was resolved to do something, it was done no matter what the cost. The main pretext for invasion would be religious. Timur claimed the Muslim rulers of northern India were too concerned with worldly pursuits. In his opinion, they had failed to show the light of Islam to their quote-unquote idolater populations. Timur planned to capitalize on the years of civil war and disorder which had plagued India Blood would be spilt by the men of Tartary once more. 90,000 men were formed up for war. 1,000 miles of massive mountain ranges, gigantic rivers, and new flora and fauna awaited them. The march began in the spring of 1398. It would be a year-long devastating campaign. As Timur marched south, he decided to deal with the Kafir tribes who lived in the mountains first. These were the same tribesmen who had remained unconquered since the times of Alexander the Great. At the top of the world, Timur and his men grappled, not only with the elements, but with the hostile tribesmen. Casualties were incredibly high. By the campaign's end, all the men of the Tartar hordes were horseless. Most horses plunged to their deaths, or they died of the freezing temperatures. Even through this, Timur was successful in destroying the Kafir tribe. By August, the armies of Timur had reached Kabul. They rested, recuperated, and brought in fresh mounts. Before leaving, a massive train of loot was paraded before the emperor. This train took a full two days to pass, it heartened many of the newer men on the campaign, as they now had some idea of what was to come. By September, the Tartar horsemen were in full gear. Pierre Muhammad, grandson of Timur, was besieging Multan in present-day Pakistan. The siege lasted over six months. By the end, the inhabitants were eating the dead, and the Tartar horses were all dead of disease. Local rulers attempted to relieve the siege but upon Timur's advance, they retreated. The Punjab province of present-day India was the next to suffer the wrath of Timur and his armies. Whole towns and villages fled at the advance of the Tatars. Many thousands sought refuge in the city of Batnir. When the city fell, the people were given to the sword. The few survivors were enslaved. Timur had strewn a path of barbarism for a thousand miles. By December, he was at the gates of the massive city of Delhi. Armed with the experience of his heir at Multan, Timur wished to capture Delhi as quickly as possible. Rather than waiting through a protracted siege, he felt he would be able to draw out the garrison, forcing a decisive battle for the city. To do this, he brought forward 100,000 Hindu prisoners he had captured along the way. In front of the gates, he had each one massacred. So vast was the slaughter that the holy men of Timur's army were forced to act as executioners. They chopped off the heads of innocent women and children with tears in their eyes, as they knew they would be next if they dare refuse. To prepare for the Indian armies and their vaunted elephants, 
Timur ordered his men to dig trenches and place massive stakes in the animal's way. Next, he ordered his troops to tie water buffaloes together in front of the trenches. After that was done, they tied dry wood to the humps of camels and tied them up near the water buffalo. He would use these animals in a way which would devastate his opposition. Finally, he called his stargazers forward. He wanted them to predict the future. When they consulted the sky, however, the portents were not favorable. They considered it prudent to wait for this engagement. This was not what Timur wanted to hear, and he ordered the astrologers be removed from his sight. He then called upon his copy of the Koran. He opened it to the book of Jonah and read aloud, quote, Crops, sustaining man and beast, grow luxuriantly. But, as the earth's tenants begin to think themselves its masters, down comes our scourge upon it, unquote. The Quran had seemingly prophesied another victory for Timur and his men. The Indians marched out from behind their walls on December 17, 1398. Forming their center were the armored elephants, bellowing their awful cries. As battle commenced, the Indians attempted to gain an initial advantage by crushing the Tartar right. The elite men of this wing held until Timur's vanguard managed to envelop the Indian flank. The Indians retreated with heavy casualties. It was then that the elephants were called up. Timur had been waiting for this moment. He brought forward his camels, who were carrying dry grass and wood on their humps. This kindling was then set alight, causing the animals to stampede toward the elephants. Upon seeing the fire headed toward them, the elephants panicked and started destroying hundreds of Indians. Heads were crushed underfoot, and the panicked animals only further destroyed Indian morale. As this scene of carnage occurred, Pierre Muhammad charged the panicked Indians. The route was on, and Timur had accomplished a more impossible feat than the great Khan Genghis or Alexander of Macedon. The next day, Timur entered Delhi in triumph his horsetail banner waving in the breeze. The various leaders of Delhi fled after their defeat, while the holy men and administrators begged for the city to be spared. The surviving elephants were brought before Timur and made to bow and trumpet in anticipation of his arrival. What follows next is unclear. What is clear is that the amnesty granted to the citizens of Delhi did not last long. Tartar men continued to enter the city in search of the loot and the women they were promised. In response, the inhabitants attempted to defend themselves. This volatile situation gave way to general slaughter. The Hindu population attempted to hide themselves in the city's mosques, but these were forced open and the people inside were all murdered. For three days, the Hindu population was thus dispatched. It would take over a hundred years for Delhi to recover from the long nightmare. Timur was not directly involved in the genocide taking place. He was busy in his tent with the harem of the conquered leaders of Delhi. None of his officers would dare disturb him. Regardless, upon discovering how the city had been destroyed, Timur seemed to be nonplussed. Far from this being the extent of the degradation, the army departed northward in search of more quote-unquote heathens to waylay. His men first sacked the Mirut, slaughtering quote, 48 boatloads of Hindus, unquote, and countless Zoroastrians. Lahore, Kashmir, and Jammu were next to suffer untold depravity. To state the opinion of R. Ernest and Trevor N. Dupuy, quote, probably no more senseless, bloody, or devastating campaign has ever been fought." Unquote. However, Timur was beginning to show signs that he was all too human. In Kashmir, he developed a tumor on his arm. As the march home continued, boils grew on the emperor's feet. He could no longer ride a horse and was carried on a litter. In spite of these physical ailments, Timur's mind was as keen as ever. 
he had destroyed the northern half of the Indian subcontinent. Starvation, disease, and corpses were all that remained to tell the tale of the shadow of death. Timor had bestrode the world like a colossus, and returned from India with its spoils as promised. Most awe-inspiring were the massive elephants with which Timor returned to Samarkand. These animals would prove to be a major part of his future campaigns, as their novelty and ability to induce fear more than made up for the massive amount of food they needed. Timor had made his most exciting return yet, but he would soon face great challenges to the West. In 1396, the last crusade was stopped dead in its tracks by the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid the Thunderbolt. He supposedly slaughtered thousands of Europe's greatest knights on the fields of Nicopolis. This demonstrated that the Arab cultures of Middle Asia were in a much more advanced position militarily than their European counterparts. Nicopolis was part of a larger military trend. In almost all engagements, Christendom was defeated by the more mobile and organized Muslim armies. Additionally, news had arrived in Samarkand. Miran Shah, Timur's second son, was living a life of complete debauchery and constantly abusing his citizens and wives. This could not stand. Timur was ruthless in war, but he would not allow callousness in his governors. Even those related to him could not escape censure. To make matters worse, the long rebellious leader of Baghdad had retaken the city with the help of Egypt and the Ottomans. In no time at all, the entire western half of Timur's empire was in open rebellion. He had only four months to recuperate before turning his victorious Indian armies west and marching with all haste to replace the corrupt Miran Shah. This would be the start of the seven-year campaign. Timur had already conquered much of India, subjugated the Golden Horde, and destroyed the will of Persia. Now he would bring the fight to Egypt, Syria, and Turkey. Upon arriving at Miran Shah's capital of Sultanaya, Timur had several officials and supervisors put to death and made his son give up leadership of the city. Following this, Georgia was plundered by the Tartar hordes. The rest of 1399 were spent in the foothills of Kedaba, replenishing their strength and resting their horses. That spring, Timur would invade Georgia for a fifth time. The Georgians retreated high into mountain caves. For a time, this stymied the Tartar assault. Timur ordered construction of baskets which would be able to fit a man inside. Teams used the rope and pulley technique to send these baskets down the mountainsides, allowing archers inside the baskets to send flaming arrows shooting into the caves. The ensuing fires smoked out the Georgians, who were hiding in the caves. They careened to their deaths on the precipices below. Once more the Georgian capital was stormed, and the inhabitants given a choice, become a Muslim or lose your life. Many thousands chose the latter rather than give up their faith. The rest of Asia was attempting to form a common alliance against Timur. In Turkey, as well as in Syria and Egypt, the various rulers believed that if they banded together, they could eliminate Timur and his troops' violent presence throughout their land. Christendom was faltering, and the Great Schism would only further weaken Christian kingdoms. Seeing Timur's powerful neighbors turn their energies toward him, he decided to make the first move, and sent a letter to Ottoman Sultan Bayezid I. Quote, Since the ship of your unfathomable ambition has been shipwrecked in the abyss of self-love, it would be wise for you to lower the sails of your rashness and cast the anchor of repentance in the port of sincerity, which is also the port of safety. Lest, by the tempest of our vengeance, you should perish in the sea of punishment which you deserve, take care of yourself, and try, by your good conduct, to preserve the dominions of your ancestors, and let your ambitious foot not attempt to tread beyond the limits of your 
little power. Cease your proud extravagances, lest the cold wind of hatred should extinguish the flambeau of peace. Unquote. Bayezid was unimpressed by Timur. He responded, quote, For a long time we have wanted to wage war against you. God be praised, our will has now been achieved, and we have decided to march against you with a formidable army. If you don't advance to meet us, we will come and seek you out and pursue you as far as Tabriz and Sultanaya. Then we shall see in whose favor heaven will declare, and which of us will be raised to victory, and which abased by a shameful defeat. Unquote. Timur wasted no time, and marched on Sivas, which lies within modern-day Turkey. The great stone walls of the city held for several weeks, but sappers, or military engineers, were underneath them, constantly undermining their integrity. Overhead, massive mangonels and battering rams further degraded the wall's structure. The city elders arrived in front of Timur, begging for the lives of the citizens. Timur agreed he would shed no blood, but unfortunately, spilling blood was not his only fatal tactic. The Christian garrison, mostly from Armenia, had their hands tied behind their back and were thrown into holes to be buried alive. The Christian inhabitants of Sivas were next. Nine thousand virgins were carried off by the Tatars, while the rest had their heads tied to their thighs as they were flung into the city's moat. Thousands drowned. As quickly as Timur arrived in Sivas, he left, leaving the countryside a desolate and barren wasteland. He camped his armies between the Ottoman and Egyptian territories, allowing him to strike in either direction. In 1399, Sultan of Egypt and Syria, Barkuk, died, leaving the ten-year-old Faraj in charge of the vast caliphate. This was exactly what Timur was waiting for. He sent a letter demanding fealty from Faraj. Timur's entreaties were ignored, and his envoy was halved at the waist by Syrian leaders. This act would not go unpunished. Timur took no time invading Syria and seeking a redress of grievances. The leaders of Aleppo begged for assistance from their sultan in Cairo. Their appeals fell on deaf ears. Syria would have to fight alone against the vast hordes of Timur. In the hopes of preventing bloodshed, Aleppo was surrendered without a fight. But to relate what happened to the city of Aleppo, from historian Ibn Tagri Burdi, quote, The women and children fled to the great mosque of Aleppo, and to the smaller mosques. But Tamerlane's men turned to follow them, bound the women with ropes as prisoners, and put the children to the sword, killing every one of them. Virgins were violated without concealment. Gentlewomen were outraged without any restraint of modesty. A Tartar would seize a woman and ravage her in the great mosque. Her father and brother and husband would see her plight and be unable to defend her. The Tartar would then leave the woman and another go to her, her body still uncovered. They then put the populace of Aleppo and its troops to the sword. Unquote. Few were spared. For four days, regardless of religion, ethnicity, or tribal heritage, the people were killed in the most horrifying ways. A desert of rubble was all that remained of Aleppo. The devastation was so vast that the bodies were thrown on top of each other in 15-foot-high, 30-foot-wide piles. The only beings left alive were the vultures, and this was only the beginning of the campaign. Timur took immense pleasure in tormenting the holy men and intellectuals in the city. As the city around them burned, Timur would hold theological debates with the imams. Those who could not answer, or answered in the wrong way, had their heads cut off. Timur wondered aloud, who was the martyr? The Syrian who died for Aleppo, or the Tartar who died capturing the city? Ad-Din Muhammad dared to answer Timur, quote, he that fights that the word of God be supreme, unquote. 
This answer so pleased Timur that he called off the rest of the city's destruction. Following the desecration of Aleppo, Damascus was next. By January 1401, Tartar forces were camped within view of the city. In a desperate move, the Egyptian sultan paid a would-be assassin to murder Timur. Disguised as a dervish in the Tartar camp, his blade was discovered and he was killed instantly, while his companions were sent back to Cairo, missing ears and noses. Timur sent a final envoy to Faraj, demanding the return of an ambassador and saying, quote, This you ought to do, if you have any compassion for yourself or your subjects. There are only two ways to choose, either peace, the consequences of which are quiet and joy, or war, which will lead to disorder and desolation. I have set both before you. It is up to you which path to follow. Consult your prudence and make your choice." Unquote. Faraj agreed, but he stalled on his promises. He secretly sent a force forward. At the same time, Timur withdrew his men to seek pasturage for his animals. The people of Damascus, seeing this, threw open their gates and began attacking the Tartar rear guard. Timur was incensed. How dare Faraj go back on his promises? He wheeled his 100,000-man army around and marched for the city. They were exhausted from months of campaigning, but they were numerous. The people of Damascus prayed that the sultan's army would be able to defeat the Tartars in the open field. The next morning, the sultan's army had retreated without a fight. The sultan apologized profusely and promised to comply with all of Timur's demands. He had left Damascus to its fate. Timur was not excited to lay siege to the great city. He sent a delegation forward, proposing terms. The people of Damascus sent their own. The famous historian Ibn Khaldun was a member of the delegation sent to Timur. Timur was as excited to meet the historian as the historian was nervous. Ibn claimed that he was in fear of his life inside the city. For his part, Ibn wanted the city to surrender. The discussion quickly turned to geography. Timur was fascinated by Ibn's homeland, the Maghreb, or North Africa. In their following meetings, Ibn would plead for the lives of his fellow men of learning. Timur obliged him, and the holy men and intellectuals of the city were spared. Ibn wrote of the emperor, quote, Some attribute to him knowledge, others attribute to him heresy, because... They note his preference for the Shia, but in all of this there is nothing. It is simply that he is highly intelligent and very perspicacious, addicted to debate and argumentation about what he knows and also what he does not know." Unquote. The gates of Damascus were opened, but the governor refused to accept the terms. He ordered the garrison to resist the Tartars from the central citadel. One thousand unsuspecting Tartars were killed. Timur ordered the walls undermined and massive towers constructed. From these towers, soldiers would hurl Greek fire into the walls. Greek fire was an early incendiary weapon, first developed by the Byzantine Empire. They used it to great effect in naval engagements, as the substance stayed alight even when it was atop water. We still don't know what the ingredients in Greek fire were, more than likely, it was some combination of quicklime and naphtha. While being incredibly frightening, it also torched human beings to their bones. The citadel held for 29 days until the governor surrendered. All that was left of the meager garrison was 29 enslaved soldiers. Timur ordered the governor beheaded and the 90-year-old officer chained up. He then began robbing the people of Damascus. But first, Timur held his men back. He demanded a million dinars from the city. After he received this, Timur claimed he had only received one-third of the total, and now all of Damascus and its property belonged to him and his men. The order was given. Damascus was ripped apart. To relate what happened to Damascus from Arab Shah, quote, they would take a man and tie a rope around his head and twist it 
until it would sink into his flesh. They would put a rope around a man's shoulders and twist it with a stick until they were torn from their sockets. They would bind another victim's thumbs behind him, then throw him on his back, pour powdered ash in his nostrils to make him, little by little, confess what he possessed. The torture would be repeated until he died. And some would tie their victims by his thumbs on the roof of the house, kindle a fire under him, and keep him thus a long time. If by chance he fell in the flames, he would be dragged out and thrown on the ground till he revived. And then he would thus be suspended a second time. Unquote. As the devastation spread, 30,000 civilians sought shelter in the Umayyad Mosque. They perished in a fire which may have been started on Timur's orders. Only the outer walls of the city remained. A vast crowd of parentless children littered the street, wailing in hunger, destined to die of disease or starvation. The people of Egypt were terrified. They feared the storm would soon break over the Sinai Peninsula and send them to their fate. But Tamor had other plans. His next target was the long, rebellious Baghdad. The city of Baghdad was six miles wide, but its size would not stop Timur's hordes. His men reached the outside of the city after a series of forced marches. They surrounded the city and began a six-month-long siege. It was a horrifyingly hot summer. On the hottest day, on the hottest hour, the assault was set in motion. The defenders were at home, not expecting any assault in such awful weather. The people, in a panic, jumped into the Euphrates River, where they were picked off by Tartar archers who were lying in wait. Timur then decided to exact his vengeance. He told his soldiers they should come back with two severed heads each. In the end, 90,000 human heads were arranged into 120 towers, which littered the wrecked Baghdad skyline. Baghdad would never recover. Timur then marched northward. The men would winter in Kadaba. The pilgrimage of destruction was over. Bayezid, the thunderbolt, was the last enemy with whom Timur needed to deal. As Aleppo, Damascus, and Baghdad burned, Timur sent his diplomats out to the enemies of his enemies. Emmanuel II of the Byzantine Empire was barely holding on against the Ottomans, who had been besieging Constantinople. He swore fealty to Timur. Additionally, the Genoese traders of the Crimean Peninsula, modern-day Ukraine, promised themselves to Timur's cause. Timur also kept in contact with Bayezid. He demanded the return of several rebellious subjects of his. Bayezid refused saying he would not compromise with the horse lord. By February of 1402, Timur was sending his wives back to Samarkand and readying his men for battle. They rapidly marched into Anatolia, stealing the initiative from the Thunderbolt. Prior to this final climactic battle, Timur ordered a grand review. Arab Shah claims that there were, quote, men of Turan, warriors of Iran, leopards of Turkestan, tigers of Balkshan, hawks of Dasht and Kata, Mongol vultures, Jata eagles, vipers of Kajend, basilisks of Andakan, wild beasts of Georgian, eagles of Zaganian, and hounds of Hisar Shaddam, horsemen of Fars, lions of Khorasan, and hyenas of Jill. Unquote. It goes on in this vein for a while. It was a true display of the Grand Empire forged through the suffering of millions. The Ottomans, however, were not to be outdone. They brought mounted Christian knights from Serbia, mounted archers from eastern Turkey, and heavy swordsmen from Rum to the battlefield. During the previous few years, however, Bayezid had become lackluster. A lifetime of drinking, partying, and bad habits was catching up to him. He was slipping both physically and mentally. His men were as prepared as ever. They were constantly in action against the best of Europe, gaining a reputation as fearsome warriors. 
However, they had never dealt with a tactician who was on Timur's level. In a series of forced marches, the Tartar Blix in a series of lightning forced marches, the Tartar Blitzkrieg completely threw off the Ottoman army's cohesion. Timur would show up in a random town, sack it, and then disappear into the countryside. Bayezid was at a loss. He was used to European knights charging headlong into his formations. Justin Morozzi says, quote, Timur had seized a crucial advantage over his opponent. Time already favored him. The Ottomans were a week's march away to the east. This gave him the opportunity to choose the most favorable ground, dig in his positions, put Ankara under siege, destroy his enemy's camp, divert the river which supplied it, and, most important, rest his march-weary men." Unquote. Timur had gained the high ground by outsmarting his opponent. He put his faith wholly in his horsemen and their ability to follow instruction without question. The time had come to finish off the Ottomans. Over 140,000 Tatars looked down on only 85,000 to 120,000 Ottomans. In the months prior to the battle, Timur had reached out to the many thousands of Tatars in Bayezid's army. He promised them spoils and untold riches if they simply joined Timur's hordes. The drums pounded and horns sounded. The exhausted forces of the Ottomans were immediately under fire. As the battle commenced, the Tartars of Bayezid's army defected. The Ottoman left was now in shambles. The rest of the men fled after the elite Samarkand division routed the Serbian knights. Bayezid was in the center with his men, fighting off Greek fire and elephants. They fought until the night found them completely surrounded. The Ottoman sultan surrendered to Timur, and Timur, contrary to popular belief, treated the former sultan with dignity and reinstated his sons into power. The text which stated that Bayezid was thrown into an iron cage is either poorly translated, or it's just a good piece of theater, on which playwrights like Christopher Marlowe capitalized. Regardless, the thunderbolt was silenced, and he would be dead by 1403. The Tartar forces split up in four different directions. They pillaged the wealth of Anatolia, sending anything and everything back to Samarkand. The Turks, who were still in Asia Minor, were ferried over the Bosphorus by enterprising Venetian and Genoese merchants, who charged exorbitant prices for the shuttling. The people still left in Turkey were enslaved or massacred to such an extent that Arab Shah claims, quote, not a third or fourth part of Rome escaped the havoc. Unquote. Timur's empire now stretched over the Bosphorus. If he wanted to, he could claim the northern kingdoms of Europe for his domain. The courts of Christendom scrambled to send emissaries and diplomats to the Tartar king. King Henry of Castile sent diplomat Roy de Gonzalvez de Clavijo, who kept extensive notes on his eastern travels. He was absolutely shocked at the power and glory in the East. He, like many modern racists, believed the East was a desert, full of uneducated barbarians who could never compare with Europe. His preconceived notions were shattered, and he was continually awestruck at the riches and the cities he passed by. Following Timur's subjugation of Egypt and Turkey, he noticed a small enclave of Christendom in his empire— this was the fortified city of Smyra, modern-day Izmir, Turkey. It was the last crusader state, a holdout from a bygone era, where Christendom ran headlong into the Holy Land and attempted to gain a foothold. The Knights of St. John had held the line against all. Multiple Ottoman sultans had attempted and failed to take the walls, but Timur was not one to succumb to defeat. He ordered his men to build platforms over the sea. In no time at all, massive siege towers were loosing Greek fire into the city center, as smoke rose in the aftermath. The knights resisted for weeks until the breaches and swarms of Tartar men became too overwhelming and they were overrun. The garrison was exterminated, ending the Crusades forever. A small fleet of knights was sent in support. 
Timur ordered his men to chop off the heads of the knights they had felled. He then told his hordes to fire the heads at the approaching fleet. The small fleet quickly turned around, utterly horrified. Timur had accomplished the impossible, but he still wanted more. His eyes turned east once again. China was full of quote-unquote idolaters, who refused to accept Islam. Timur wished to show them the light, and was already planning his invasion of the Middle Kingdom. Invading China would be his greatest accomplishment yet. To succeed would be a Herculean task. Timur believed that if anyone could accomplish such a feat, he could. He was now seventy-two, and he must have known that sooner or later he would die. His life was defined by devastation and the death of fellow Muslims. Now he aimed to destroy the East as well. Things in China were progressing much to Timur's liking. The former Mongol Yuan dynasty was overthrown by the peasant leader turned emperor of the new Ming dynasty, Zhu Hongzhang, or the Hongwu Emperor. He ruled China for over 30 years. Under his leadership, there was an emphasis on agricultural reform, and China flourished once more. This great emperor would be dead by 1398, paving the way for a power struggle amongst his surviving family. Timur planned on capitalizing on this complicated situation. He had already ordered forts placed along the way and requested detailed maps of the terrain. For a long time, he also stopped paying his regular tribute to the Chinese emperor. When ambassadors arrived at his court, they came asking for the tribute. Timur said he would give the Chinese emperor what was owed and that he would deliver it personally. He then sent the Chinese ambassador to sit in a place which denoted he was of a lesser importance than the Castilian ambassador, Clavijo. This was shaping up to be the most devastating campaign of Timur's life. He would need all the resources available to him to march on Peking. On the return to Samarkand, some awful bits of news reached Timur. First, Bayezid had died in captivity. How exactly, we are unsure. Next, and by far most important to Timur, was the news that his chosen heir, Mohammed Sultan, was dying. This was Jahangir's firstborn. Timur had now outlived two generations of his family. He was distraught. In spite of his massive empire and the strength of his will, could not do anything to save his grandchild. The march quickly turned into a funeral procession. The horsemen of Tartary were all clad in black. The final burial was to be in Avnik. The prince's war drum sounded for the last time, and was then smashed, never to be struck in battle, nor at court, ever again. A single cry from the assembled court reverberated across the funeral. The widow of Jahangir, who had now outlived her love and her firstborn, suffered immensely. Timur must have realized his time was coming to a close soon as well. He invaded Georgia for the sixth and final time in August of 1403. He laid waste to, quote, 700 towns and villages, unquote. The hardest fight was at Curtin. During the siege, a single soldier managed to maneuver his way through a crevice in the rock formations, granting him access to the city. Soon, many Tartar soldiers had breached the city walls. By the morning, the general assault was called. The garrison was destroyed, and the riches of the town were handed out to the Tartar soldiers. Timur had wrecked Georgia again and extracted thousands from the barely afloat Georgian king. He would winter in Karabakh for the last time before heading for Samarkand. In 1404, he learned of the death of Shaikh Baraka, his spiritual mentor, personal advisor, and friend. It seemed only Timur was left standing among the old guard. The seven-year campaign was completed in five years, as the armies of Timur marched into Samarkand in 1404. Preparations were made at once for the expedition to China. First, Timur held a Kurultai in Kanigil, where he detailed his plans for the invasion, as well as how he planned to take Peking. 
He also held an exquisite banquet to celebrate the marriages of five of his grandchildren. Even if he were to die, his dynasty would carry on. It would be the grandest banquet yet, and it would go on for over two months. It was a display of the opulence and wealth that Timur had acquired throughout his blood-stained life. He was the leader of much of the world. He had captured three-fourths of the Mongol successor empires, and he had swallowed up most of the northern Indian subcontinent. But there was still more work to be done. Following the celebrations, 200,000 men were gathered together, and the march for China began in earnest. As the march began, a huge snowstorm enveloped the entire army. The heavens opened on Timur's host. Many died on the way, but they would not stop. By mid-January, the army had reached Ortrar, in modern-day Kazakhstan. It was here that the emperor caught a cold, and his condition rapidly deteriorated. His doctors decided that to help cure him, they would place ice on his chest and head. This quote-unquote treatment did not work. Timur knew he was dying. He called his wives and most senior emirs to him and said, quote, I know my soul is about to leave my body, and I am to be taken to the throne of God, who gives life and takes it away. I beg you shed no tears at my death. Rather than tearing your clothes and running around like madmen, pray to God to have mercy on me. Say Allah Akbar, God is great, and recite the Fatiha to comfort my soul. Since God enabled me to give laws to Iran and Turan, so that throughout those kingdoms the great do not oppress the poor, I hope he will forgive my sins, which are without number. Unquote. He goes on to proclaim Pir Muhammad as his heir and orders his emirs to follow his word to the death. He closes his farewell by saying, quote, If you remain united, no one will dare oppose you, nor offer the slightest challenge in executing my last wish. After giving out final orders to his emir, his fever worsened, and in a final burst of life he cried out, quote, There is no God but God. Unquote. It is then that the chronicles claim that the angel of death, Israel, came down from his perch in heaven and called Tamir's spirit to him. Regardless of what truly happened, the emperor of the seven climes, shadow of death, was now at rest. Unfortunately for Timur, his vast empire splintered and tore itself asunder the moment he stopped breathing. His various sons and grandsons began fighting amongst themselves, each one claiming a small corner of Timur's land. His chosen heir, Pierre Muhammad, was ruling northern India and had no chance to claim the throne in Samarkand. Instead, Timur's third son, Shah Rukh, found himself the head of the former Chagatai lands. His son, Ulag Beg, was the leader of Samarkand, and under their combined rule, the center of Timur's empire continued to flourish for around fifty to sixty years. Uleg Beg was a truly gifted leader. He was a well-known astronomer, and his star charts were still used by Great Britain until the 17th century. After thirty years of rule, Beg would be murdered by his own son, and Timur's legacy fell into disrepair for many years. However, one hundred thirty years in the future, an ancestor of Timur's, known to history as Babur, would lead his small tribe out of Central Asia and run roughshod over most of India. Babur would become the first Mughal emperor, and his sons would rule the better part of the subcontinent until the 1850s, when they were finally supplanted by the British East India Company. Timur's most enduring legacy stays with us in the form of the buildings he commissioned and inspired. Timurid architecture is by far one of the most beautiful forms of building design. Its use of blues and reds, as well as its signature pomegranate structure, would inspire Middle Eastern architecture for hundreds of years. This design found its way to India, where the world-renowned Taj Mahal borrowed heavily from Timur's bold architectural choices. Finally, it found its way to the frozen plains of Russia. 
the spire-tipped Kremlin was designed with Timurid architecture in mind. Even after he passed, Timur seems to have been a harbinger of death. In 1941, Soviet archaeologist Mikhail Garisimov is credited with unearthing Timur's body. Locals in the area begged and pleaded with the professor not to do that. They believed it would invite disaster. This was not untrue. Dr. Garisimov confirmed the damage to Timur's right side, but terrible news had reached him. The Soviet Union had been invaded by Hitler. When Timur was reburied in November of 1942, the Soviet Union was putting the finishing touches on its massive victory at the Battle of Stalingrad. In another strategic move characteristic of Timur Erenkara, the weak flanks of the German army were destroyed by hard-hitting Soviet reinforcements. For nearly 40 years, Timur had marched all over Asia, shedding blood and claiming people and land for himself. His lust for power and riches was insatiable. He believed it was his ordained right to acquire all before him, like a usurping dragon. Many of the places Timur decimated ceased to exist, to the point where you couldn't find them on a map. Those cities which were able to carry on after Timur had visited them took hundreds of years to recover. Those cities to which he had given favor were enriched beyond their wildest dreams. Samarkand was a beautiful metropolitan wonder of Central Asia. Today, time and history have taken its toll on this crossland of the world. Radical Islamic extremists plague the entire region. Like Timur, they have killed countless fellow Muslims. Time has made Timur a footnote, a man at a crossroads of history between darkness and enlightenment, between exploration and isolation. His exploits were nearly beyond measure, but nothing can stop time from taking what it's owed. Now, Timur is most remembered as a character in a play or a poem. The idea of Timur seems to have fascinated many over the centuries. First, it was Christopher Marlowe, a contemporary of Shakespeare. His play, Tamburlaine the Great, parts one and two, while having an askew timeline, does an impressive job at showcasing the qualities which seem to have characterized the Tartar Emperor. Marlowe's Tamburlaine is an ode to the conqueror who was lost to time. In another work inspired by Timur, Edgar Allan Poe's epic poem tells of an ambitious man who did all he could to see his dreams come true. Like with all of Poe's work, melancholic tones pervade it. As with the historical Timur, he simply wanted too much, and the actions he took to go after what he wanted destroyed his soul. This is the story of Timur, the story of time, and how time decays all things. Timur is now buried in a corner of the earth, in a former Eastern Bloc country which was devastated by the Soviet economic structure. He has no massive headstone, nor a grand burial chamber. Only a short inscription is dedicated to him. It reads, quote, This is the resting place of the illustrious and merciful monarch, the most great sultan, the most mighty warrior, Lord Timur, conqueror of the world. Unquote. I hope you've enjoyed this history of Timur Gurgan. In the next series of Turning Tides, we will be setting sail to the beautiful island of Singapore. We'll be covering its original colonization by the Orangalaut peoples, uh, its rule by the Johor Sultanate, its colonization by Stamford Raffles, up until its survival against the Imperial Japanese Army. I'm your host, Joseph Pascone. Thank you all so much for listening. If you like what you heard today, 
You can support us by donating on PayPal at Turning Tides Podcast One. Thanks for the support and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to rate and review Turning Tides on whatever platform you use to listen and share the show on social media. It really helps us to bring the show to more listeners. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. We'd also like to say thank you to Movo Photo. We use their sound equipment for this podcast, as well as all of our other projects at Antics Entertainment. They make great equipment at great prices, and we really appreciate that they make content creating so accessible for indie creators like us. Check them out on social media at Movo Photo, M-O-V-O-P-H-O-T-O. Thank you again.